But now let's move to the second book. And I am particularly happy to have with us today Professor John Hartley, uh, first author of the second book on the digital semiosphere. And John is a distinguished emeritus professor at Curtin University in Western Australia and, and well known and highly appreciated also in Estonia. And the book is written, co-written indeed, with two Estonian colleagues, Indrek Ibrus and Maria Oyama, and published by uh, Bloomsbury Academic, the publishing house in, in London. So we hope that we have John online with us. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Marek. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, I hardly need to speak after what Dominic has said, so uh, I'm very appreciative of that. But I will press on. Yesterday was Australia Day. The Australian flag was in evidence as usual, not least as an offensive weapon wielded on cars and boats and baby strollers as a marker of selfish entitlement, signalling contempt for what Rupert Murdoch's Daily Telegraph had called a ragbag rabble of far-left agitators uh, led by Greens, unions and educational bodies. So Australia Day is highly strongly contested as Invasion Day and Survival Day for Indigenous people. It is no, no longer credible as a day of national unity and pride. The very terms are partisan and provocative. Instead, it's a good day to reflect on the extent to which nations can no longer hope to call populations together under the unifying uh, image of the flag, such as Roland Barthes analyzed in Mythologies and as Benedict Anderson did in Imagined Communities. For Barthes, mythology was an ideology of empire, saluting the flag. For Anderson, an imagined community was the artifact of what he calls print capitalism, uh, reading the newspaper. So this is where contemporary media and cultural studies came in. I remember the days. Uh, seeking systematic links between the inner world of cultural subjectivity, the workings of texts and media, the mechanisms of technology, economics and politics. In Language and Power, Anderson poses still unresolved questions. Uh, politically, how to understand what conflicting groups have done to each other. Morally, how to conjoin human solidarity with respect and difference and theoretically, how to link the splendors of the imagining life with remorseless engines of global economic and technical change. That's a quote ben Benedict Anderson. Well, on the digital semiosphere is an attempt to address the same issues for the digital age. What is digital culture for, or what could it be for? What's changed is not colonialism and nationalism, power and conflict, but technology, media, and globalization, and with them, knowledge. Now, we can imagine ourselves not as a tribe or a nation, but as one species on one planet. We know each other and the world through digital media and internet connectivity. But there are very few available discourses for, for experiencing humanity as one global we. One reason that one such discourse is science, it claims universality, the universality of its own laws and of its methods. Another is popular culture, music and screen, me, social media and entertainment. Check BTS. Of course, these forms of knowledge are compromised too by state and corporate interests. Nevertheless, science and popular culture have converged to the, uh, have converged in the contemporary mo um, global digital media from pandemic Pandemic conspiracy theories to climate justice activism. Here, check Greta Thunberg, who reminded the World Economic Forum only yesterday, as well as her millions of followers on Instagram and Twitter, you can't negotiate with physics. How then can we understand the possibilities as well as the constraints of social and digital media at planetary scale? Our book argues that it's necessary to start not from power and economics, but from culture. 
Culture is the systemic and adaptive mechanism by means of which humans create groups, texts, or uh, what we call deems, uh, and knowledge, using the resources of sphere to codify past memory, present action, and future possibility spaces. Understanding these mechanisms and their interrelated layers from microtext via meso institution to macro system is key to understanding how groups interact in conflict and difference and how knowledge is contested as well as communicated. In short, culture, seen as an evolutionary system of the biosphere, is primary. Politics, economics, and technology are its outputs. Check, for example, Bernie's mittens. The first thinker to systematize such an approach was Yuri Lotman, extending Vernadsky's biosphere to the semiosphere. We build on Lotman's model to integrate culture, media, and science in order to address persistent problems of knowledge, how to scale up from competitive conflicts to planetary collective action in relation to climate justice, pandemics, and other global challenges, check Me Too and BLM. How to conciliate incommensurate modes of knowing science and popular culture, and how to build cultural dynamics, conflict and difference into system science. Lotman, Bart and Anderson were all engaged with the same issues. Taking sides is no longer enough. Flag waving is part of the problem, not the solution. As the extent of planetary human destructiveness becomes daily more apparent, we ask how the digital semiosphere might conjoin human solidarity with difference and the imagining life to regulate chaotic techno-economic expansion uh, by nations and empires. What new, what new world class is emerging to lead collective action to regulate the Earth system? And that's a question for you. Thank you, John, very much. Thank Thanks. you indeed. And thank you for being with us at this very early moment in Australia. And let's move to the second author of the book and uh, welcome Maria Oyama uh, from the University of Tartu to second John's talk. Please, Maria. Hello. Good evening, good late night, uh, whatever you happen to have. Um, I think John gave a very good um, it's a general overview of the topics and issues that our book is about, uh, but perhaps a logical question to follow from here is, okay, but still, why Lotman? Why do we think that for tackling the problems of global digital era, uh, we should seek answers from the work of someone whose scientific background is in 18th and 19th century Russian literature? Uh, obviously, one could give a, a full graduate course or, or two on this topic, but I'll still use my uh, bit less than five minutes to uh, highlight just two key points. So first, the model of the semiosphere itself. So that is the model of uh, semiotic space or the space of uh, meaning. It advocates the idea that even the smallest unit of knowledge, any a meaning can arise, can exist, can be expressed only within a more general space of semiosis. And unlike what the uh, traditional division of disciplines might make us think, uh, let's say literature, visual arts, social media, legislative systems, uh, they can cannot be made full sense of or comprehensive sense of as autonomous units only, uh, but they can be made sense of, should be made sense of as interrelated via dialogues, via translations, and as immersed in a semisphere. So Lotman shows us how a complex uh, system precedes simpler units, uh, perhaps somewhat paradoxically, right? And the model of the semiosphere makes it very clear that uh, culture is consisted in relations and not in autonomous units and uh, uh, autonomous systems and linear courses uh, between them. 
Right. Uh, the second key point uh, that I bring out perhaps unexpectedly uh, in this context is Lotman's notion of text. Uh, yeah, we're all aware uh, that uh, quite widely text is considered to be a structuralist construction that appears outdated during the digital times uh, that are all about uh, dynamic processes and change. Uh, yet, uh, as for example, one of Lotman's students, Peter Dorop, has uh, argued uh, the core principles of the semiosphere model were implicitly present already in Lotman's treatment of the artistic texts. And most notably, perhaps, uh, we should stop at uh, him being inspired by the cybernetic network and uh, it's occurring to Lotman that texts are not only mediators of constant meanings, and they just not they not don't just transfer constant information, but they also function as creators and uh, of new meanings and also memorize uh, meanings that precede themselves. Uh, and this combination of these three functionalities made Lotman also claim that the model of artificial intelligence, for example, should be based on the model of artistic text. Uh, but that's a side note. Uh, when we get back to these three uh, functions, uh, uh, these functions of creativity and memory become activated in the process of reading. So they imply a reader, uh, which can be a single human being, but it could also be the situation of, let's say, digital culture rereading Shakespeare. And this also uh, makes evident a semispheric principle that creativity is not sourced in an individual author, but always implies culture is sourced in culture, a larger system. And does take effect only through dialogic relations held within a larger cultural environment. So, uh, in conclusion, um, the multiscalar applicability, let's say, of Lotman's notions of text and semiosphere allowed us to organically connect this micro, meso, and macro layers of digital culture. And this is to demonstrate how or demonstrate the interrelatedness of individual digital texts, the institutions that govern their production, and thirdly, the planetary system and communication, and indeed, uh, both the threat of, of climate catastrophe and the COVID pandemic have made the need for such, or understanding the interrelatedness of the most intimate and the global levels more evident than ever before, right? Thank you, Mario. Thank you very much. And I have a good news for the Estonian readers, namely um, Tallinn University Press uh, is willing to translate the book into Estonian and publish it. So maybe in the near future also Estonian readers can enjoy the book.